glad we got a, we have a uh, we have a remnant tonight and praise the Lord for it. It's always good to gather together. Amen. Always good. Yeah. Always good to be able to just uh, open up his word and and uh, fellowship with the body. Uh, um, and, 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 you know, it's, it's been a crazy day. You know, you guys probably know. <laughs> it's crazy, craziness in, in the world. And, uh, you know, we have an anchor. We have a hope in Jesus. And I was just thinking about that as we were worshiping tonight. That our hope isn't on Capitol Hill. Our hope is on Calvary's Hill. Amen. Uh, and, and it's one of those things where we just, are, I think our task, our duty, our mission in, in the midst of all of this is, thank you, sir, is to stay the course and to just be busy about the Lord's work because he's got a plan. And his plan, as we're going to see tonight in the text, sometimes his plan isn't what we think his plan should be. Have you ever been there in life? You ever looked at a situation and say, God, this is not my plan for you. This is not lining up with what I want. And you know, sometimes that's a really hard thing to look at. It's a really hard thing to face. And I, and I think it's, the, the hope that we have is that God is always faithful. His word is true. And that hindsight will be twenty twenty, Even if it's not in this lifetime. Even if it's not in this physical realm, hindsight will be 2020 one day when all is said and done. When all is said and done, there's going to be a day when it's complete. God's word is complete. There's going to be a day when the last soul has come to Jesus, and not just before the rapture, but even after the millennial reign of Christ, when the work of the cross is completed. Phew. That's crazy to think about. It blows my mind. But anyways, we, got, we, got, we, got, we still got a ways to go before then, right? So we need to be uh, aware and busy about our Father's business. And I think it's more important now than any time before for us to have our own walk with the Lord, our own personal relationship with God so that we can go out into this world and have a joy that's not of this world so that people will be drawn to that and wonder what is going on and hopefully ask you, what is the reason for the hope that is in you? And we have the answer to say, let me tell you about the reason for the hope that is in me because my hope isn't a hope in this kingdom. I'm a citizen of heaven. Yes! Okay. So... Here we are together gathering as the people of the Lord and getting into the word tonight. And I'm glad that we get to do this. Um, it's what we need. We need to look at the word. We need to get our eyes off of the world. I don't know, I don't know man. If you've, if you've had your eyes on the world all day, you're probably going, ah, what are we going to do? What's happening? There's crazy people and all the things and uh, up, down, all over the place. That, that's the problem. I, I was praying with a, a brother earlier this evening. And, and the, the scripture came to mind. He is at perfect peace whose eyes are fixed on, not the world, that's for sure, on him because we trust in him. Our peace comes from looking and fixing our eyes upon him, looking to God and not looking to those things around. So anyways, we're here to look at him. Amen? Amen. So, and that's what we need. So let's just, I want to start off with a prayer uh, once again this evening. Lord, we just come before you, and as we look into your word, we ask for your spirit. Holy Spirit, we ask you to be present with us this evening, to reveal to us ourselves, our, our hearts, which, I mean, basically is enemy number one. We pray that you reveal to us ourselves, and we ask for willing hearts that as you reveal the places that we need to change in our lives, that you give us the power to change. God, and remind us that the power to change has nothing to do with our strength and everything to do with your power. Nothing to do with, with our effort and everything to do with your faithfulness. 
Lord. Uh, we, we come and we hear and we seek to apply, but Lord, we need your spirit and we need your strength and we need your power to walk in this life. And we ask for it tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. So I've been reading a, a, a book on spiritual discipline and um, I'm not very far into it, but really when we, when we think about getting close to the Lord and, and, uh, and we think about gaining his power, we have our responsibility and really our responsibility has to do with how often we bring ourselves before God and allow him access to our hearts and our lives. The less that happens, obviously, the less we're going to be conformed into his image and transformed, or not conformed to the world, but transformed into his image. So we need to put ourselves and position ourselves in a place when we are before him, allowing him to do a work in our lives. And one of those is here. So for all of you guys that are here tonight, good job. For all of you who are joining online, good job. We got a lot of praying to do. Hopefully, uh, hopefully this stuff will just keep moving past through. If not, we still trust in the Lord. God is still good. But that's not the only way. Church is not the only way. But second, I would say, the second one, equally important as fellowship, as getting in the Word together, is our one-on-one -on -one time sitting and exposing ourselves to the Spirit of God. Bringing ourselves to that place of being in the moment with Jesus with him. That's one of the things that I think of in my morning time. I just kind of, I try to quiet myself, quiet my mind, which is difficult. I don't know if you've ever sat down and said, I'm going to quiet my mind before the Lord. That's hard to do because you think about all the people you need to pray for and all the things that are going on and that person and this thing, which is funny because my dad would say, well, get a pin out because you're going to get a reminder and the enemy's going to throw all these thoughts in your head. You just write them all down and take care of those later. But to quiet our mind and to spend that one-on-one -on -one time with him in the moment, practicing being with him in his presence, letting him be just present. You know, as, uh, I, I think I mentioned this before, but I was reading through another book that was talking about looking inward. And, and there's a, <laughs> looking inward can be, I heard another article on it just recently, and I went, oh, that's the wrong kind of looking inward. Because there's a looking inward that says you have the answer inside you to all of the problems. Eh, wrong answer. You are the problem, right? And so our heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. We, we are the problem. But for the believer in Christ, we can't exclude God from the equation because looking inward means asking him to do a work. You are the temple. I am the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. So for us to stop is to say, Holy Spirit, I'm going to quiet myself. And I'm going to allow you to move and work in our lives. It's, very, it's really important. It's an important time. Um, and also, we can never exclude, and you probably know exactly what I'm going to say, the Word of God. We can never exclude God's Word and allowing the Word of God to work in us. Without God's Word, we're lost. We need His Word to be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our Path, absolutely. Okay. So Lord, help us to do that and stay in fellowship, communion with you, and in your word. Amen? So we're picking up tonight in 2 Kings chapter 4. Oh my goodness, it's been a while. You know, last week was one of those crazy ones. I don't know if you guys got the update on that, but I, <laughs> I, I, got, I got weird Sometimes you can get weird. Sometimes you can get in your head. And uh, my head did that thing to me. I was feeling a little bit weird. I had some allergies. I've had allergies for a couple of weeks now. And then uh, somebody else had some allergy symptoms and got tested, and they had COVID. And then somebody else that afternoon got po tested positive, and they only had allergy symptoms. And so I went, ah! And I stayed home last Wednesday night. And, you know, just with the, with the, with the thought of not exposing anyone if I had it, because I felt weird. And I woke up in the morning, and I looked at my wife, and I said, babe, I'm not sick. And I just, I just knew I wasn't sick. And so anyways, I went and got tested anyways, and he said, negative. And I said, I'm really more of a positive person. But if you're going to say negative, great. That'd be awesome. 
And uh, yeah, so anyways, uh, the week went on as kind of as business as usual, and so here we are. But we're picking up in the life of Elisha. It's been a few weeks, I think three. And last time we saw, the last place that we really were, um, we saw the battle between Israel, Judah, Edom versus Moab. I don't know if you guys remember that, but the three kingdoms versus Moab and the three kingdoms, the three kings, if you remember, they all got together. They went around the seven-day journey, the south end of the Dead Sea, to come around the corner and catch Moab off guard because it would have been like a straight shot down from the, from the north, and they did not do that. They went the long journey, and if you guys remember, on the way, they ran out of something. Yep, absolutely. Ran out of water. <laughs> and so they ran out of water, and uh-oh, we got a problem. We're famished. We can't go fighting. We're going to die of thirst. We don't have energy. We can't go back. It's seven days. You go on a seven-day hike with no water. It's no good. It's tough. So here they are in this pickle, and they cry out to God, and they, I remember Jehoshaphat says, is there a man of, is there a man of God anywhere? Again, it's ready, shoot, aim. He had the cart before the horse. It was backwards. We want to cry out to the Lord before we go out and count the cost, right? Jesus uh, mentioned that. Not, not, not building a, a house before you count the cost first. So anyways, uh, they did this, but God still had mercy, and they cried out for a man of God, and just so happened Elisha was there. A God thing again. Elisha seems to be a lot of times in the right place at the right time. And we're going to see tonight, it was kind of normal for him to just hear what God was doing. Man, Lord, it's funny because when I, when I hear that, I think that's kind of like the abnormal for me. Every once in a while, I go, God, did you just say that? Is that really you? Because I don't know. Usually I'm not hearing that clearly, but Elisha, man, this guy had a relationship with God that I want that we should all want. So anyways, God, if you remember, they cried out to God. God provided their needs and a way of escape through having them do something really practical. Dig a bunch of holes in the middle of the desert. I mean, you would, in my mind, I would think, well, you dig a hole, you hit something, right? You strike a well or something. That's not what happened. Just dig a whole bunch of holes out in this valley, and then the Lord said, you're not going to see clouds, you're not going to see anything, I'm going to provide for you. And that evening, or that night, we're not sure exactly when, we, all we know is that in the morning, the holes were full of water. And the reason we know that is because not only did God provide water and, and provide for their need and provide for their armies and the animals that were bringing the gear and all those things, but God used that very water for their victory. Remember that? The sun started coming up, and the, and the sun reflecting off the water shone red, and they said, oh, they've all killed themselves, and they kind of went out with their guard down to go just kind of see the carnage, and nothing had happened except they got refreshed. <laughs> and so they went to battle, and they beat Moab. And then they did what God had told them. They plugged up the wells, they did all those things, and we sort of come to the end of this section. We come to the end of these battles and, and of, of these kings for a couple of chapters here. Um, there's going to be a mention of the king, but there's not going to be um, really, the king's not going to have a whole lot to do with what's going on. We're really just looking at the life of Elisha and some of the miraculous things that he got to be a part of, that he got to be used by God in an, extra, in an extraordinary way um, because of his relationship with the Lord. So last chapter, um, we looked at the beginning of this section. We looked at one of his miscellaneous miracles at the beginning of chapter 4, as God used him, if you remember, to provide for the woman who was a widow. Her husband had just passed and left their family a debt, and the debtor collectors came to take her two sons and put them into slavery to pay the debt. And she would have been destitute all alone. And, and she cried out to Elisha, and Elisha asked what she had, and she said, well, I got this little jar of oil. And Elisha said, go get as many containers as you possibly can. She sent the boys out to get as many containers as she possibly could. And I don't think I mentioned this last time, but it's, just, it's worth mentioning. And they brought all these containers back, and they begin to fill these containers, and the containers, she filled them until they were all full. There's, there's just something that I, I wanted to mention that, with these containers, in order to pour oil into the containers, they have to be what? Empty. Empty. 
empty. And, and it's, it's really the same. It's a picture of the same for us. In order for the Spirit to come in and fill us, our lives, we've got to be emptied of self. We've got to be emptied of pride. You know, pride is like the number one enemy of God working in our lives, of the Spirit filling us up. Because when we have pride, it's all us. And we think we got it. We think we got it under control. In fact, what does the scripture say? God does what to the pride? To the proud. He resists the proud. Yeah. But he gives grace to the what? Oh, he gives grace to the humble. In other words, I can't afford to be proud. Lord, keep us humble. Because I need your grace in my life. I need your grace. So, anyways, good picture that we would come before the Lord and be empty so that he could fill us up. Okay, so moving on. We're introduced in verse 8 of chapter 4 to a woman from Shunem, who's really a pretty amazing gal. So let's check it out, verse 8. And now it happened one day that Elisha went to Shunem, where there was a notable woman, and she persuaded him to eat some food. And so it was, as often as he passed by, he would turn in there and eat some food. So he has this, this little relationship that happens uh, in his life. And in this season of life, there's a couple of things we gather here. Number one, this woman was, it says, notable. And, and we're going to see here it was not just the woman, but the woman and her husband were, were notable. And so one of, the, one of the ways we could say notable was they seemed to have some money. They seemed to be, be wealthy enough. They're going to provide for Elisha. They're going to feed him. And they're going to do something else we're going to see shortly. But so it's, it's this notable woman, but also I would say notable because she seems to be a godly woman. She sees a prophet of God working in a time when the kingdom, if you remember, Israel, was not very close to the Lord. In fact, they were worshiping uh, at false altars and mostly Baal worship and all these things. So here, here she is in a, in a time when it would have been challenging for her to go ahead and support a man of God, and she does it anyways. And she sees what he's doing, and she, I, I would say she loves what he's doing in his service, and she wants to do something for him. He didn't ask her for help. He didn't say, man, I'm hungry. Can you feed me? She saw somebody serving and said, how can I help this guy push forward? How can I serve him so that he can serve the Lord? It's just an awesome heart. We also gather from, from the text that he passed by quite a bit. Every time he'd stop by, for some reason, it was on the path, on his normal uh, kind of route, I guess you would say. He would come in often to eat, and every time he passed, he'd come in to the fast food. It was the first Shunammite McDonald's. No, it wasn't the Shunammite McDonald's. Maybe Chick-fil-A? I don't know. Anyways. But commentaries believe that Elisha was picking up where Elijah left off, continuing with the ministry of these schools of the prophets. You guys remember when Elijah was taken up, that he stopped at Jericho, and he stopped at Bethel, and he stopped at these places where there was these uh, schools of, of prophets. And so here we have what we would assume is he's just continuing this ministry circuit and traveling around regularly to do ministry, minister to these sons of the prophets, um, and train, training them up to have a relationship, training up younger people, these sons of the prophets, to have a relationship with the Lord. And, and as I'm reading this, I don't know if it's sons of the prophets, like they're all of these boys, parents are all prophets. I kind of don't think that's the way that it's being portrayed. I think it's more like the prophets, Elijah, Elisha, a few of the other prophets, they're like the school of the kids. They're prophets' kids because they kind of take them in and they just say, hey, these are, you guys are, you're Jesus' kids, right? And so there's this discipleship ministry in that. I just kind of associate that as being the name. So some of the commentaries say that Shunem was about the halfway point and this woman started, I guess, the first food ministry. So here she is feeding the prophet, feeding his assistant. And again, in this text, when we look at Elisha, he seems to be more personable than Elijah. Elijah, I think, would rather go out and sit on a rock and have a crow bring him something to eat than Elisha. For some reason, Elisha just starts this relationship with this couple, and it's, it's a neat thing. So verse 9, and she says to her husband, 
Look now, I know that this is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. Please let us make a small upper room on the wall and let us put a bed for him there and a table and a chair and a lampstand so it will be whenever he comes to us, he can turn in there. So awesome, right? So they decide, hey, you know what? Let's make an addition. Let's, let's add on. And she asked her husband, can we, can we do an upstairs addition and add on a room for this man of God? And, so, and, and we get this picture now. Some of the commentaries believe that there was probably an outside stairway from, from the out, outside. So he, he didn't have to come in and you know, go through the house to get to his room. So they made this, I don't know, prophet suite. I don't know what you want to call it. Just a cool, awesome little place for him to turn and get, take a nap, or obviously he's got a lampstand, maybe read some scriptures, whatever he's doing. I just, it's just a sweet thing. And for more than just being a sweet thing, it's, that's a big deal. It sounds like a small addition to us, but that's a really big deal back in that day and age. And, and, and it's just an awesome thing that was on their heart and an act of kindness that they did for this man of God. Verse 11, and it happened one day that he came there and he turned into the upper room and he laid down there and he said to uh, Gehazi, his servant, call this Shunammite woman. And when he had called her, she stood before him and he said to him, say now to her, look, you have been concerned for us with all this care. What can I do for you? Do you want me to speak on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? And she answered, I dwell among my own people. So, so here we have this, again, interesting character of Elisha. Just to, He's going, man, you do all this for me. This is so cool. And I love it and I appreciate it. And I want to return the favor, so to speak. I want to let you know, what can I do for you? You want me to talk to somebody for you? She, as Elisha appreciates what's been uh, done for him and to him. And she says to his servant, or he says to his servant, what can I do? And I just think that's, it's an, it's an absolute neat thing that he does. And really what she says is, I don't need anything. I, I live with my people, which is really to just say, I'm content. I'm with my family. I live with my people. I'm content. God's been faithful to me. I don't, I'm not in need. I'm okay. There's nothing. Again, I just love that she lives in a time where God's not being honored in Israel. And I believe she could have been heavily persecuted for what she was doing, but she acknowledges God. She cares for God's man. What a heart. And I think, of course, she's, her heart is she's kind of got the, without the Holy Spirit there in that capacity like he is today in our day and age, she's kind of got the gift of helps just to reach out and to help this guy. But she's definitely loving God by loving his people, and that's something that we can do. It's a practical thing that we can do. <laughs> I don't want to, ah, maybe I just won't say it. I don't want to lose my heavenly reward, so I can't share this story with you guys. But, you know, there's always that opportunity, and I just think we are, I mean, we're just, we're never more like the Lord than when we help, when we give. God so loved the world that he gave. And it's just an awesome thing. I, I, it's, it's a privilege, and I, and I think that we practically need to seek for the Lord to give us opportunities to go help our neighbors. Like, just straight up, be the hands and feet of the Lord, you know? And don't be scared to name drop some God and Jesus on them and show them some love. I don't, that's kind of interesting, name dropping. I don't, if you've ever known somebody that liked to name drop and tell you kind of like who the famous people they knew were, man, we got the best one, Jesus. Name drop my, my best friend, my Savior. Okay, verse 14. So she said... What then is to be done for her? I'm sorry. He said, <laughs> what is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, actually, she has no son, and her husband is old. So he said, call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the doorway, and, and then he said, about this time next year, you shall embrace 
a son. And she said, shut it, basically. She said, no way. No, my Lord, man of God, do not lie to me, right? So she's, she's got a good reaction. But the woman conceived and bore a son at the appointed time, uh, when the appointed time had come of which Elisha had told her. So, of course, it's a miraculous, amazing miracle. She's older. Her husband, I guess, is a little older than her even. My husband's old. And it was one of those things that the people of Israel would have, especially in that culture, they would have looked at this woman as having some issue with God. Well, because it was a blessing. It was a very desirable thing to have a child. So they would have looked at her and thought, well, something's not quite right. She might have a sin. Something's going on in her life. And she's, she's cursed by God because she doesn't have any children. But obviously, she did want children all of her life. She just had never been able to have one. So at this point in her life, she's, she's settled in it. She's okay with it. She's going, it's, it's all right. This is just my cards. This is what God has done. He just hasn't given me a kid. I'm okay with that. So she accepts it. But the man of God says, of course, being led by the Lord, you're going to have a child. <laughs> and I, I think of Sarah, right? The chuckle, right? It's just like, wow. that's a nice thought. But stop it, right? And I love that response. I love, I love her. It's just so real and just so human. She just says no. And she's not at the place of, I don't know, she, she's just saying, I'm not there. I can't have a child. She doesn't accept it. And she's of the heart to say, don't try to give me hope for that when there's no hope. Like, don't stir that hope up. Don't stir that what if up in my life. But the word of God came to pass through Elisha, and God gave this woman a child. Again, this is, this, this is, a couple of the commentaries I went through said, this is the gift, it's the miracle of life. Only God can give life. And, and at this point, it's a miracle that God gives this woman a child. And, and, and so even though the odds are stacked against all of it, verse 17, but the woman, she conceived and she bore a son when the appointed time have, had come, of which Elisha had told her, and the child grew. And now it happened one day that he went out to his father, uh, to the reapers, and, and he said to his father, my head, my head. And, and so the father said to his servant, carry him to his mother. And I think that's probably standard dad mode, MO operation, right? Oh, I'm out here working. Kid's got a headache. Somebody take that kid to his mom, you know? And so that's what happens. They're out in the field gathering grain. Now, we're not exactly sure what happened. A couple of things could have happened. A lot of the commentaries want to say, I think the kid had a heat stroke. He's out in the field. He's gathering. Maybe he had a, had a heat stroke, and his, his head is hurting. But it sounds like it could have been even more than that, as we're going to see here just in a second. It could have been a brain aneurysm. We're not sure. We're, we're only sure that He's got a bad headache, and he goes, the servant, servant picks him up, which is kind of a little bit of an insight. He's small enough. He's not a teenager at this point out helping. He's small enough to a servant pick him up and run him to mom. So verse 20, and when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees until noon, and then he died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. So right off the bat, she responds in faith because she takes him and gets him ready for a resurrection rather than the grave. And it's an interesting thing because in the Jewish tradition, it is like almost immediately that you bury the person that day. You take them and you bury them. And that's still, that's still Jewish tradition today. They don't wait around. They don't they take them and put them in the ground and honor their, their death there. But she hasn't given up. She takes him to the prophet's bed and shuts the door behind him. Verse 22. And then she called to her husband and said, Please send me one of the young men and one of the donkeys that I may run to the man of God and come back. And so he said, why are you going to him today? It's not a new moon. It's not a Sabbath. He's saying, it's not Sunday. Why are you going to church? That's really what he's saying. It's not one of the feast days. I don't get it. 
why do you want to go see the man of God? And she said, it is well. And then she saddled the donkey and said to her servant, drive and go forward. Do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. So she gets on her donkey and redlines it, right? Got it revved to the limit. So, verse 25, And so he, she departed and went to the man of God at Mount Carmel. And so it was when the man of God saw her afar off, that he said to his servant, Gehazi, look, the Shudamite woman. Please run now to meet her and say to her, Is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, It is well. Now when she came to the man of God at the hill, she caught him by the feet, but Gehazi came near to push her away. But the man of God said, let her alone, for her soul is in deep distress, and the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. Interesting. A few things that are interesting. One of them right off the bat there, I'm not sure exactly if this is later down in my notes, but one of it right off the bat here, Elisha was surprised that he didn't know she was going to be there. He was surprised that the Lord hadn't revealed it to him already. And I just, that's that instance. I'm saying, I'm the opposite. I'm more shocked when God reveals something and, it, and it, I'm like, whoa. This guy was, I don't, he, he was close to the Lord. Uh, it's an absolute amazing thing. He thought it was strange. In verse 28, so she said, did I ask a son of my Lord? Did I not say, do not deceive me? So she goes back to that word she said. And when I, when I look at this woman, she's got a lot of faith to do what she did. She's got a lot of faith to not bury her son, to not tell her husband the boy's dead, to not tell everyone on the way and mourn and weep and cry. No, she says, no, at this time it is well. And she makes a beeline to the man of God. And, and, I, and the biggest thing to me at this whole picture, why would she do that? Why would she have this faith? She trusted the word of God. God said she was going to have a son, and she trusted that. Even though death showed up on her door, she still trusted. It's just an awesome display to me of faith. But she goes, and she goes to plead, and she goes to the man of God to fall at his feet and really ask for the resurrection of her son. And she says, it is well. To everyone who asked, in the midst of the greatest, I would say, the greatest storm of her entire life, her world is shaking, and she tells these people on the way, it is well. It is well. But she had a destination in mind. She knew the one that she needed to fall before, the man of God, and to plead. But on the way, it was well. Again, because she was trusting and hoping in the word of God. Now, I don't, there's a song that we sing here sometimes, pretty often. It's a, it's a hymn called, It Is Well With My Soul. It was written by a, a man named Horatio Spafford, who was in America, did some work with Dwight Moody, and his family had gone back to Europe. On the way back to Europe, his wife and his four daughters, their ship capsized. And his wife survived and sent for him, saying, please come, all is lost. Tragically, his four daughters died in the shipwreck. So uh, upon receiving the letter, he immediately got on the first ship back to Europe. And the account goes like this, the historical record of it goes that he asked the captain, when we get to the place where their ship went down on the journey back to Europe, would you wake me up? I just want to, I want you to wake me up at that place. And so he went to his chambers, and he really didn't sleep that night. He got into the Word. And when the captain, in the middle of the night, went to wake him, he was there reading his Bible, and he was reading this passage of Scripture. Of this woman, 
whose child had died. And he was left in the upper room going to the man of God and all the way saying, it is well. And he went up to the deck and he wrote the song, it is well with my soul. He wrote a song that says, when sorrows like sea billows roll, this is a hope that comes only from knowing Jesus. It is well. It is well with my soul because my Savior defeated the grave. What an awesome hope. Because the the truth is there are people alive walking around today, people that we love, who are in all reality more dead than Horatio's daughters, more dead than this boy laying on the bed. If they are without the man of God, who in our picture, in our story this evening, the son of man, Jesus, the savior, the master, if they're without him, he is the one who we need to bring them to, to fall at his feet. We learn from this woman, fall at the feet of the master and plead that he would bring our lost loved ones to life. Amen? So one more thing, and, and we've got to go back to the, the Jewish thought. It was sort of a normal thought, again, that this woman, now that her child has died, the thought would have been, well, see, there is sin. There's a problem with this woman. There's a, there's a, a, a thought that would transfer to this situation, that, that, this, that her son died because of some sin in her life. I, I just want to remind you of something. God doesn't punish us like that. God wouldn't, if you have a child or someone in your life close to you that dies, God doesn't punish or, or, or put at someone to death in your life for your sin. He already did. He put his son to death. A child already died for all sin. So this isn't something that God does in life. Though sin has come into this world and death has entered this world, and until he makes that all right, it's going to happen. But he's good. He is faithful, amen? Okay, let's keep going. Verse 29. And then he said to Gehazi, Get yourself ready and take my staff in your hand and be on your way. And if you meet anyone, do not greet him. And if he greets you, do not answer him, but lay my staff on the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, as the Lord lives, as your soul lives, I will not leave you. And so he arose and followed her, and Gehazi went on ahead of them and laid the staff on the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing. Therefore he went back to meet him and told him, saying, the child has not awakened. And when Elijah came into the house, there was the child lying dead on his bed. And he went in, therefore, and shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. And he went up and lay on the child. And he put his mouth on his mouth and his eyes on his eyes and his hands on his hands. And he stretched himself out on the child and the flesh of the child became warm. Then he returned and walked back and forth in the house And again, he went up and stretched himself out on him. And then the child sneezed seven times. Best sound in the world, I'm sure, to mom, right? And the child opened his eyes, and he called Gehazi and said, Call this Shunammite woman. And so he called her. And when she came in to him, he said, Pick up your son. And so she went in and fell at his feet and bowed to the ground And then she picked up her son and went out. (laughs) Interesting. Just an awesome miracle. An awesome thing to look at. I don't, I never, I never, you go through commentaries, there are some commentaries that want to try to explain how some kind of warming happened and how some kind of thing physically happened. I say, no, God, this guy was dead. On his bed, some commentaries believe that this journey on the donkey to go get the man of God was a few days. That there's a a dead boy laying there for a couple of days. 
I don't care how much you lay on this kid, he's not warming up. After a few days, you guys know what happens. The, the blood starts to settle and the um, what's that? plasma separates and the whole back is purple and rigor mortis has come and gone by that point. There's just there's a whole mess of things that begins to happen instantly. The process just starts as soon as the body starts to cool. This is a miracle of God. It's interesting. So right off the bat, the man of God says, send the staff. (laughs) That's funny. So many commentaries go, man, you know, don't send the staff. Go yourself. They're talking about church staff, right? When 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 I think about it, I think, man, I am just a church staff. What you need is the man of God, Jesus. That's like one of my philosophies. That's like one of my main things. It's like, yes, we do want to live our lives in a way so that we could tell people, follow me as I follow Christ. But when it comes down to it, I cannot fix your problems. I got to introduce you to Jesus. He's the one. I can't make you right. I can't right your wrong. I can do none of those things. I can't forgive your sin. I can't tell you that he's done it. That's between you and him, but I got to introduce you to him. I got to introduce you to him. And so, it's interesting though, he told him, take the staff, go lay it on his face. And I mean, people get baffled by that. That's again, that's Elisha, we believe, led by God, go do this, and it didn't work. One of the commentaries said, maybe this woman's faith was so wrapped up in Elisha that she didn't believe that God would use the staff. I don't know. I don't know. Again, we need to keep our eyes on the Lord. But Elisha went and prayed. He goes into this room, he shuts the door, and, he, and he, what, the first thing that he does, he prayed to the Lord, just the two of them. I love this. Elisha is a human. He didn't know what to do. He went into that room and he prayed. Is there a situation you come in life where you don't know what to do? I know what you need to do. You know what you need to do. Pray, first thing. Not later, first thing. But Elisha goes in, first thing he does is praise. He prays for direction. And by the leading of the Lord, for some reason, he lays on this child whose body was cold. And it says there in the scripture that he began to warm. We're not sure the significance of this. We know that God is doing a healing in him and Elisha's just being obedient. We also know that Elijah did something really similar. I don't know if you guys remember that. Elijah healed a boy who was dead in a very, very uh, similar way. I shouldn't say Elijah. Elijah was the tool. God healed a boy through Elijah in a very similar way. <clears throat> so, and then after he lays on him, it seems that there's still an act of worry. What does he do? He gets up, he goes downstairs, and he's pacing, basically. He's walking back and forth in the house. And he goes back up and he lays on him again. Uh, And you see this humanity to it. I I want you to think about when Jesus rose Lazarus from the grave. What did Jesus do? Oh, he just said, Lazarus, arise and come forth. There was no, I don't know what to do. There was no pacing. There was none of that stuff. Jesus is God, the God man, God in the flesh. We are Elisha. We don't know what to do. God, help me. Show me, lead me, pacing. Ah, what do we do? What do we do with our nation? We trust the Lord. And I almost look at this and think to myself, in our situation, your pacing isn't helping. You can't do anything. In fact, lay down and be still and let me work. Stop and be still and let me work. So many times we get in the way. And we're trying everything we think we can. And God's just waiting for us to stop. (laughs) So anyways, in this case, I believe he was led by the Lord. He goes up, he lays down on the child again, and the child had a seven in a row sneeze attack. And you never know anybody that does like seven in a row sneeze attack. Anybody in here do that? Usually with me, it's okay, we got a couple in the back. Usually with me, it's like once. I think the most I've ever done is like two. But I've known people that are like, choo, 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 and you're like, whoa. <laughs> I thought you were like karate chopping back there or something. But yes, anyways, it can happen. But again, what a sweet, awesome sound. 
And what does she do when her son is healed? She went in and she fell, verse 37, at his feet, and she bowed to the ground, and then she picked her son up and went out. She bowed, fell before Elijah. I just, I don't know, I just love it. A picture of what we should do when those in our lives that we're crying out to the the Lord for come to him, that we would just worship him. Amen? Okay, so now we get the next couple of stories. Let's try to finish this chapter up before we get out of here. The next couple of little miracles. Verse 38, And so Elisha returned to Gilgal, and there was a famine in the land. And now the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, and he said to his servant, Put on the large pot and boil stew for the sons of the prophets. So one went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered from it a lapful of wild gourds. Now when he had sliced them into the pot, or he, and came and sliced them into the pot of stew, though they did not know what they were. And when they served it to the men to eat, and now it happened as they were eating the stew that they cried out and said, Man of God, there is death in the pot. And they could not eat. And so he said to them, bring some flour and put it in the pot. And said, serve it to the people that they may eat. And there was nothing harmful in the pot. This is another interesting, just (laughs) random, miscellaneous miracle here with the big pot, with the death in the pot. Have you ever had anything and thought, there's death in the pot? Have you ever drank in the water in Mexico, maybe, and thought, there's death in the pot, right? <laughs> I personally, I don't, I don't, I, am, I just imagine, this is, what, this is where my mind goes, so forgive me for my mind going here. When I was, a, when I was younger, I wasn't a kid, I was, I was, I can't remember, I think Ethan was, was born. But anyways, I was, it was right after he was born, that was a long time ago, so 15, 16 years ago, and I was with my grandma, we were at her, her in-law's house in the valley, and there was all these, on the lining of the property, there was all these orange trees everywhere, humongous oranges. And I'm just like, yeah, I'm going to eat me some oranges. And I start going over there. My grandma's like, hey, where are you going? I'm like, I'm going to get some of these oranges. She's like, oh, those, you can't eat those oranges. And I'm like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? I can't eat these oranges. She's like, those are decorative oranges. I'm like, they're growing on a tree, grandma. That's real. That's the real thing. They're not plastic. Those are real trees. Those are real oranges. I had no idea. I'm not from the valley. I had no idea that there were some oranges that you just don't eat. Anyways, I peeled it, and it was huge, and I was, took a big old bite. Immediately, it just started burning my face and my mouth, and I'm like, ah, and it was like eating some kind of acid. It was absolutely horrible. First thing that pops in my mind, death in the pot, you know, so... She was right. I should have listened to grandma. You guys, moral of the story, listen to your grandma. Okay. So right off the bat, we see in this section of scripture, there's a famine in the land, which means that God is working to get the attention of Israel, um, uh, who were being idolatrous, right? So Israel, they're spiritually famished. There's also a famine in the land. And so uh, Elisha comes and says, hey, go get the big pot, put it on. Let's make a stew for everybody so we can have something to eat. And so some of the young guys go out, the, the, the sons of the prophets go out, and they're collecting herbs, something to put in the stew, and they come across a wild vine with some fruit on it. In my mind, I'm thinking, have you guys ever seen any of the, like, kind of the, I don't even know what they are, but the vines that grow around here are kind of wild, and they'll have stuff on them. I think it's the same. I don't know if it's poisonous, but I know they're not good. What? Gourds. Gourds. Yeah, I think it is. Gourds. So, anyways, if you guys get a wild hair, go taste one. No, I'm just kidding. You shouldn't do it. <clears throat> but anyways, that's what I think of. I think, and there's a couple on the corner over by my parents' house before you go up the road to there. There's just a vine there every, like almost every year, and there's these gourds on it. And so it's the middle of a famine. There's gourds on a vine. First thing right there, something's wrong with the gourds. That you're in the middle of a famine. There's a huge wild vine full of gourds. You would think an animal, something would have eaten the gourds. But no, they just run out there and they go, ooh, look at all these. Yes. It must have been ripe and good looking. Uh, Yeah. So he gets it. They take it. They chop it up and put it into uh, this pot. 
And they, and they start eating it. And of course, you guys know the death in the pot. I said it too many times already. Um, but we get an interesting picture here. The stew that's being cooked, and when I think of stew, automatically I think there's probably some meat in there. I don't know what kind. Maybe they were boiling the chicken bones. I don't know what they were doing, but they were trying to get every last bit of whatever they could in this famine. And so anyways, they're, they're cooking this. I would think there'd be some meat. And I don't know, at, at the very least, you would think there'd be some kind of grains, but you don't know. Might not have been. Maybe some rice, maybe not. I don't know what, what they had to put in there. But these young men, they take something from a wild vine, they chop it up, they add it to. Now, the, the, the stew or the pot could be a picture of the word, having the meat, the word. And they take something wild, something foreign, something that shouldn't be, and they chop it up and they add it to the picture of the word. And they started taking it in. And it was bad. They realized immediately, this is death. It's an interesting picture for us. That we're not to add to or take away from the word of God. Any uh, worldly prophecies or philosophies or the metaphysical or whatever it is, don't add to the word of God. Let the word of God be the word. It's that which feeds us and which nourishes us and causes us to grow. I think immediately of 1 Corinthians, we've been, we went through the section where Paul said, you guys still need the milk, but you should be eating the meat, right? And, and so what happens? They cry out to Elisha, Elisha, there's death in the pot. And what does he do? Well, you've got a pot that's got some bad stuff added to it already, I'll tell you what he doesn't do. He doesn't say, everybody, try to take out the pieces that are in there. Just put your hand in and start pulling stuff out. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say to remove anything from the pot. He just says, add the flour, add the meal, which again, representation of the word of God. It's another awesome picture for us. Because we'll, we'll see people's pot and we'll think, man, we got to clean you up. We got to start removing things from your life. That's not the way to do it. What they need to do is start adding the word of God. And the word of God will begin to purify their life. The word of God will begin to change the way they think. Like it says in Romans, that it'll renew their mind. The word of God is powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. Able to divide those issues of the heart between the soul it's just important for us to know. It's not our job to try to clean someone else's life. It is our job to not add wild things to our pot. But it's the job to take in that word of God and let it do the purifying work, especially in the lives of other people. And we're going to see such an awesome picture of that next week. I really thought I was going to go through the next chapter. I need to start moving quicker. Remind me to do two chapters next time. I don't know if I can, but you can remind me if you want to. I'll, I'll, I'll do the best I can. Let's just finish up. Verse 42. Then a man came from Baal Shalisha mm -hmm, and brought the man of God bread of the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley bread, uh, newly ripened grain in his knapsack, and he said, Give it to the people that they may eat. But the servant said, What? Shall I set this before a hundred men? And he said again, give it to the people that they may eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left over. So he said it before them, and they ate, and they had some left over according to the word of the Lord. This is a, a, just a, a real quick, interesting picture. Really, it looks forward to the multiplication of the, the loaves and the fish by Jesus. It really kind of looks forward to that. Um, but this guy comes and he brings, he brings this offering he, and he really, he brings the offering to the priests because there's no, I mean, to the prophets, because there's no priesthood going on. There's no offerings happening, but this is an offering of the first fruits. It's a biblical offering. And so he goes, well, I know a man of God and I'm, I'm going to take this. And so he brings his offering to the, to the prophets. He brings it in and who is it that says it? Does it say it? It says, he says, give it to the people that they may eat. But the servant says, what? 
shall I take this before 100 men? You know, so here's what the servant is thinking. The servant, and I immediately think this was probably in the commentaries I went through did to Elisha and Gehazi or whatever his name is. We're going to see him again next week too. But so, so this servant, this, this um, helper to the prophet is going, Elisha, there's not enough for 100 people, but there's a good meal for us. If we could just keep this for ourselves and hold it back. And one of the reasons probably that he's saying this is because these loaves, these loaves of barley bread, back in that day, their loaves weren't like a loaf with slices like bread, you know, like you buy at the store. They were kind of like buns or, you know, little, little rolls. And so he's probably thinking there's no way that 20 loaves are going to feed 100 people, and they shouldn't. But according to the direction that God was giving, he gave it to all the people, and they ate. And he said, and you're going to have some left over. Again, that just is pointing to Jesus. And so he laid it before them, and they ate, and of course they had some left over. According to what? According to the word of the Lord. Let's all stand together. God, we thank you tonight for your word. And just like we just read, God, I pray that you help us to trust your word. I pray that you help us to have the word just as an anchor that keeps us solid. Like Jesus said, that it would be our foundation that we would build on the rock. And the rock that Jesus spoke of, the rock, the solid foundation that Jesus spoke of was to, to hear your word and to do your word. <laughs> God, thank you for that rock. Help us, especially during these trying times, to continue to live founded on the rock. To have that solid foundation, immovable by what may come. That we would know, whatever comes down the pike, it is well with my soul. Thank you for giving us that hope, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this time and this fellowship. Lord, thank you for letting us feast upon your word and not add to, but keep heaping in your word into our lives. So Lord, I pray you bless your people as we go out, God. Strengthen us for the days ahead. In Jesus' name, and all God's children said, amen. 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 amen.